The following Stealing the Mind Bible Conference presentation is by Job Martin and is entitled The Trinity in Time, Space, and Matter. For a free catalog of all of our tapes and books, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 or on the web at compass.org. We're glad to be with you all. My name is Job Martin, and I'm here with my wife, Janity. And now, as Bill introduced us, she married a dentist. Now she's not sure what she married. But anyway, uh, I was an agnostic Zen Buddhist evolutionist when I got out of dental school. And um, then I became a Christian. I became a theistic evolutionist. And then I gave my first lecture on the evolution of the tooth as a professor at Baylor Dental College. And two of my students challenged me and said, did I ever think about creation science in 1971? And so ultimately I became a young earth, a global flood about 4,500 years ago, a flood uh, in the days of Noah. And uh, those are normal days in Genesis, type of a creationist, and there I remain. Uh, last year, I think we did share some of the comments that we get from the NEA convention. Uh, did I do that? Does anybody remember? Oh, I didn't do it very well. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we were there again this year, Washington, D.C., the National Educators Association, and a man came up to me, and he says, do you remember me? And I didn't. And he says, well, two years ago... I lambasted you for an hour and a half in Dallas. I says, oh yeah, I think I do remember you. He was right in my face, a, a, a evolutionist, a scientist, and a teacher. He said, you know, you gave me some books that had to do with creation. I've read those books, and he said, I, uh, he said I'm not in, in your camp yet, but I'm kind of moving in your direction, and I just want to thank you for being here. So, well, praise the Lord. That was really nice. And uh, today our subject is the Godhead and the creation, and I'm going to jump around just a little bit. Uh, our worldview, that's how we think in our heart, that's our worldview, and today we'll be combining a little bit of theology and biology, and in all these areas, theology, philosophy, ethics, biology, psychology, law, sociology, politics, economics, history, it's what we send our children off to school to study, uh, they're all biblical categories, they've been perverted in our system of education for the most part, but your worldview is your set of beliefs, what you believe about things, if, if you don't believe those chapters of Genesis to be uh, the Word of God, then that affects the rest of what you believe, and that determines your values, uh, what's important to you. Now, this is like a big iceberg. You don't see this. What you see is behavior. So your behavior is your outward display to the watching world of what you really believe deep down in your heart. So you have a young person in your youth group that acts like the devil but says they're a Christian. Well, they're probably not a Christian. Now, I suppose they could be, but they're probably not. Uh, our behavior really displays what we really believe. Uh, you're a businessman, and you go to church on Sunday, and then uh, you, you uh, do dishonest things out there. Your behavior in the business world probably shows what you really believe deep down in your heart. You better examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. So that's our worldview, and as Christians, we should be equipped to defend that worldview, and that's why you're here. What's it say in 1 Peter 3? But if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, of their intimidation. Neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you to give reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and with fear. So that's what we're supposed to do. That's what you're here to do. Equip yourselves to better defend the faith. So are we sending our children out then as mission fields or as missionaries? I was sent out of my home as a mission field, and I got into Zen Buddhism and other things, even though I was raised in a home that would have called itself a Christian home. And I saw a sign out there. It said, uh, we're losing about 70% of our evangelical Christian young people by the end of four years of college. And, and that's what we find as we, as we go around. So our statistics, well, I have it right here. Statistics show that 70, 80% of our Christian youth are losing their faith in four years of college. They're throwing it all out. They're buying into other religious worldviews. Uh, that's what I did. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's so many things that seem right out there. But they're not right, because there's only one way that is right, and that's what the Bible talks about. So we live in Satan's world system. The Bible says he's the prince and the power of the air, and the foundation of that system is deception. It's lies, and Kent was uh, telling you how that works, and uh, Mike was telling you about the apostates, how that works. It's all deception, and that's what we see uh, in the cultures of the world. So Satan is a liar and the father of lies, John 8, 44, and he is. And the whole world follows after him, except for a few people, most of you in this room. 
Uh, so Satan uses lies to deceive. What's the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 2.11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Well, his primary device is deception. So we have to be always uh, uh, on our guard that we're not deceived. Therefore, we must put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6.11. So we're in a spiritual battle. And that battle penetrates, uh, in the context of Ephesians, written to the church, it penetrates the church. Uh, in the context of Ephesians 5 and 6, it penetrates the, the husband-wife relationship, the parent-child relationship, the employer-employee relationship, uh, right in the church. So we have to be aware of what's going on and not, and not be deceived. And so when I go on the college campuses, I always say, well, let's, let's take a look at some world lit. And nobody ever complains. Who's going to complain about world lit? Uh, are there any professors that would say, no, you're not allowed to look at some world lit? None, no, none ever do. So we go to Romans 1. And, uh, well, is, uh, is Romans 1 part of world lit? Well, of course, it's some of the oldest world lit. It says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, I hope you're not. I, that's probably why you're here, to better defend the gospel. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And we do, and so does everybody else. And now God changes his tone. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, this is a certain kind of men. It's men who hold, King James, New American Standards, suppress. So there are men who uh, are ungodly and unrighteous, so they're holding back, they're suppressing something. Well, what, what are they suppressing? Well, they're suppressing, they hold back the truth in unrighteousness. So they're holding back some truth. That means they don't tell us about some things. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. Now, what kind of truth are people holding back, these ungodly, unrighteous people? For the invisible things of Him, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Oh, so there's people that study what God has made, and then they don't tell you about it. Now, Kent Hovind listed a whole lot of things that probably many of you don't know anything about, because the evolutionists can't explain it in evolutionary terms, so they don't tell us about it. And we'll talk about one of those in just a minute. But anyway, even His eternal power and Godhead, do you mean you can see things about the Godhead? That's the Trinity. You can see things about the Godhead in the creation, in the things that God has made? Well, that's what he's telling us here. The rest of that goes on to say, so they're without excuse, because that when they knew God, people study the things that God has made, and they learn about God, and they even learn about the Trinity. And, uh, but then they glorified him not as God, and neither were thankful. So they don't say, oh, God, you're wonderful. Uh, you can make a giraffe so he doesn't blow his brains out when he gets a drink of water. That is wonderful. Uh, you can make a bombardier beetle that shoots its enemies with fiery hot gases. Uh, that is wonderful. No, they won't do that. So what happens then? Well, they become vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. And I was a fool. I was a fool. I was 27 years old, an agnostic Zen Buddhist evolutionist. I was a total fool. Uh, then I became a Christian evolutionist. I accepted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I became a Christian evolutionist. I was still a fool in that area because I believed the words of men instead of the words of God. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. God says, I made it. Man says, no, 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 no. It was an accident. It just happened. Long time, here it goes, the impersonal plus time plus chance, random, mindless, accidental processes, and here you sit. See, they, they, they don't believe it. And so then God turns them over, and, and they change the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever, Romans 1, 16 to 25. And that's where the cultures are of the world. Romans 1 says, unrighteous, ungodly men study what God has made... And then they suppress, they hold back the facts, since they can't explain them in evolutionary terms. So I thought I might share one with you, it's, it's on our, our new video, we just got that, you're going to be the first ones to have that, we picked them up in Colorado Springs on the way up here. Uh, there's a little muscle called the lampsilis muscle, it's not, not this kind of a muscle, it's like a little clam, and this little muscle in its soft tissue, it mimics particular species 
of minnows and shiners and tiny little fish. The muscle mimics them. Now, there's two kinds of these muscles. One kind is called a generalist, and it, it can attract any particular fish, any fish it can attract with its little bait here. But there are some kind, they're, they're called specialists. They have to attract exactly the right species of fish. And so here you have this little muscle down on the bottom of the pond. It puts its soft tissue up on top of its shell, and it sits here wiggling around like a minnow. Some of them look like they're gulping for air. And it needs a largemouth bass to want to come down and eat the minnow. And so here comes a perch. And the perch gets down here and is looking at it like, I think I'll eat that. And the lampsilus muscle says, oh, ho, that's not a bass. I don't want it to eat my bait, so it pulls it inside. How does it know the difference between a perch and a bass? Okay, there's a PhD problem for some of you young people, okay? Now, let's say here it is, it's here wiggling around this particular species of minnow that the largemouth bass likes to eat. Here comes the largemouth bass. It looks at it and says, oh, that looks good. I think I'll eat it. The split second it opens its mouth to take the bait, the lampsilus opens up and shoots all its eggs and larvae up into the mouth of the bass. They attach to the gills. We have an incredible shot we got from public television, I think, where they have actually in the gills showing these little teeny muscles grabbing hold of the gills. They grab a hold of the gills. That's where they grow up. They drink the blood. It's, it's more a symbiotic rather than a parasitic relationship. But the, anyway, they, they drink the blood of the bass, and then when they're big enough, they drop off. Well, how would that evolve, you see? And here's some problems. We need some young PhDs in lampsilus muscles to tell us how does a muscle know that's the right fish? It's just a bunch of jelly inside of a, a shell down here wiggling around. And how does it mimic, how does it make itself look like exactly the right kind of a little minnow? And then the timing is incredible because the split, you know, if you go fishing, you know how fast a, a fish takes the bait. It's like, whoop, and it's got it. The split second that that bass opens its mouth to take that bait, that little thing opens up and shoots all its eggs and larvae up into its mouth. How does it do that? How does it see? How does it know what's going on? How does it sense all that? Nobody knows. Uh, so if we have time, we'll come back and talk about another one or two little things. But anyway, what's a foundational lie of the devil? The Bible doesn't teach the idea of a Trinitarian God. Uh, there's no such thing as the Trinity, says the devil. Jesus was just a man. He wasn't God. What, the Holy Spirit? Well, that's just a force, like electricity. That's not a person. Those are lies of the devil to deny the Trinity. Let's not forget, he is a liar and a master deceiver. Now, Harvard University began 1836, John Harvard, Thomas Shepard. It started as an evangelical Christian college equipping young men to be equipped to go share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in their doctrinal statement. You can still see that on the internet. About 200 years, they used Blackstone's law commentaries. They taught out of the Bible at Harvard. They, they would have agreed with us. They would have thought just like we do, most of us right here. Then in 1805, Harvard went Unitarian. Here comes a new dean. Here comes some new professors he brings in. And now they deny the Trinity. Jesus was just a man, okay? They went Unitarian. And then in 1839, here comes Horace Mann, a Unitarian, and he established government-paid education. Unitarian, denied the Trinity. Jesus is not God. So God, Jesus, God says in the Bible that we can see aspects of the Trinity in the Bible. All right, just starting right here. In the beginning, God created. That's the first phrase in the Bible. We already have a mistake. God is the Hebrew word Elohim. It's a plural noun, but the verb he created in the singular, it's a third person. In the Hebrew, it's a third person singular. He created. So we have a plural noun with a singular verb. Did God make a grammatical mistake in his very first sentence? A plural noun and a singular verb? I mean, that's not good English. Uh, that, that's the same as saying they was. I mean, that's not even good Hebrew, okay? <laughs> I mean, what is going on here? Uh, well, he's telling us in his very first phrase, I am a plural Elohim, but I am a singular he created. So the God of the Bible is three, but he is one. And this shows up in his creation. We're going to look at that in just a minute. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but it's one God. So we Christians, we're not really monotheists. We're Trinitarians. We're not polytheists. We don't have many gods. We have one God who is three. 
And we'll try to describe this as we go, but you can't, you can't describe it completely because there's nothing that is a perfect picture of the Trinitarian God of the Bible. Isaiah 6, 3 says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now, why does he say holy, holy, holy? Well, of course, in Hebrew, if you have the same word three times, it, it's absolute. Like in English, we might say God is perfectly, absolutely holy. In Hebrew, they use the same word three times for absolute. But also, could it be saying that we have one God who is three persons and each are holy? God the Father is holy, God the Son is holy, and God the Spirit is holy. So our Father is holy, 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 and He is the Lord of hosts. And we are not holy. And so we have to find a way to come before a holy God because we're not holy. And that's being cleansed by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. So God created, created, created. He says that in Genesis 5, 1 and 2, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day God created man in the likeness of God, made he him, male and female, created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Created, created, created. You can't get any more created than that. Now, if God, if God wanted to tell us that he evolved us, could he have said he evolved, evolved, evolved us? Of course he could have, but he didn't. By the way, people argue about the Hebrew words bara and asa. They're both here. He created man. That is bara. In the likeness of God, made he him. That's asa. They're used interchangeably. Some people try to make a big case out of those two words, and they'll try to say, well, he made some things, uh, but they just appeared later on. Like, he already had made the sun, and it just appeared on the uh, fourth day, things like that. No, they're used interchangeably. Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I, singular, send, and who will go for us? In one sentence, God goes from the singular to the plural, because He is a singular, but He is a plural. And then said I, here am I, send me. By the way, when's the last time you said that? When's the last time you said to God, God, here am I, send me. Uh, do we need Christians to say, God, here am I, send me, to Muslim countries. Do we ever? We just got back a couple weeks ago from England and Denmark. Do we need missionaries in England and Denmark? Do we ever? Denmark is dead, spiritually dead. There's church steeples all over everywhere, and it's just dead. So maybe God would call some of you to say, you know what? Here am I, God. Send me. I'm heading for Denmark. Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He didn't, God didn't say, let me make man in my image after my likeness. You see, our God is a plural, but he is a singular. Matthew 28, 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name singular of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It's not baptizing them in the names of, it's in the name of. We have one God who is three persons. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. We have Jesus the Son, we have God the Father, and we have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. God the Father is male. God the Son is male. God the Holy Spirit is male. Not an it. The Greek word for spirit is neuter and should be accompanied by a neuter pronoun. However, contrary to normal usage, the masculine pronoun is frequently used. For if I go not away, says Jesus, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, unto you. And when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he, the Holy Spirit, will reprove the world of sin. So God is a masculine. He's not a mother, father, God. He is a masculine. Okay, now I was asked to speak at a divinity school near Dallas. And uh, they said, now when you come, we use inclusive language at our school. We don't pray to God the Father. We, play, we pray to our mother, father, God. Okay. Yes. And I said, well, I can't do that. And uh, they let me come. But anyway, the Trinitarian God of the Bible. By the way, I'll tell you another thing. Uh, over the 4th of July, of course, we were in Washington, D.C. at the NEA convention. And uh, we got to speak at a big Bible church in Washington, D.C., and so they opened up, we're, we're teaching the high school class, 150 high school young people, and the youth pastor started out with a six-minute video clip where he had gone in to two of the homes of two of the girls in his youth group and videotaped their bedrooms with all their stuff all over everywhere. 
He had zoomed in in the one girl's room on her underwear, and then he had put a picture of himself on their dresser, and he zoomed in on that and said, oh, look, look, at, look, at the, look, they have my picture in their room. This is the youth pastor, and this was shown to 150 high school young people. That's called deception, absolute deception. What was he trying to do? Well, you see, we need discernment as God's people, and that's what you find here with the different speakers. We're trying to help us all together, all of us together, me, all of us. We need discernment. Okay, the Trinitarian God of the Bible. I got off track a little bit there. <laughs> Scripture teaches that the essence of the one God pertaining to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is simple and indivisible. Also, that the Father differs in some special property from the Son, and the Son from the Spirit, and the Spirit from the Father, but they are one in the Godhead. Our children, our Christian children, are constantly being intimidated in classrooms across our country uh, through pointed questions. For instance, where did Cain... Okay, I'm going to be the professor. This is English 101, okay? And I'm the professor, and you're my new freshman English class. How many of you out there are Christians? Okay, a few of you. Um, <laughs> now, uh, you, some Christian tell me, where did Cain get his wife? Oh, yeah, I thought, he said his sister, you Christians, you're a bunch of, you like incest, you are totally depraved, everybody knows to marry your sister is incest, uh, we need to rid this world of you Christians, and you won't be a Christian by the time you end this class with all that myth, I mean, marry your sister, that's incest, well, what do you do next? Well, you see, that's what's happening to our kids, what do you do next, okay? Well, when did incest become incest? During the law of Moses. Up until the law of Moses, it was perfectly okay to marry your sister. God is populating the earth, okay? The Bible says in the law of Moses, don't do that anymore. And you know another thing? How could it be possible Noah could get all those animals on that ark? You all have seen pictures of the ark. It's the little boat with the giraffe sticking out the top. You remember that. You saw that in your Sunday school literature. And you know what happens? That's the picture comes up in the minds of our kids. By the way, they have a good replica of the ark out there. Go take a look at that. They've got these little models. We got one. Uh, they have, th that's the picture, though. Even in Sunday school literature, this little teeny boat, okay? Uh, no, it wasn't like that. It's this big, huge boat. Uh, you Christians, you're just a bunch of polytheists. You believe in many gods. Why, you believe in at least three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And by the way, you probably even have four. You got that one you call the devil, and you pay more attention to him than you do the other three. By the way, this is what's going on in the college classrooms around our country. I know, because I've talked to so many of them. We just got off University of Virginia, uh, Piedmont College. I was at the New Jersey Dental School here just a couple weeks ago. We'll be up at the University of Minnesota, all three campuses coming up here in February. We can't answer the questions, you see? All right, so let's think about this. Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from, that's the Greek word apo or apa, from, it means from or by or since or because of means some other things from the creation of the world are clearly seen. For the invisible things of Him by the creation of the world are clearly seen. Uh, for the invisible things of the world, uh, for the invisible things of Him because of the creation of the world are clearly seen. They're all legitimate translations of that word. Even as eternal power and Godhead. Okay, so let's say from the creation or by or because of the creation, we can see aspects of the Godhead. So we can see evidence of the Trinity in the things that God has made, even though the cre creation suffers from the curse. So we can't, it can't be an exact picture of the Trinity. Uh, for example, it came to pass that Jesus, also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon Him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in Thee I am well pleased. Well, we can't duplicate that kind of a thing. I mean, we have God the Father speaking out of heaven. Jesus is down here on earth being baptized, and the Holy Spirit comes down as a dove. So we can't duplicate that type of a trinity. And yet God says, I mean, Jesus can be here, and God the Father over here, and yet they're one? How do you think about that? Uh, I don't think we really can think about that, but He does tell us in Romans 1 we can see aspects of the trinity in what God has made. So let's think about that. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. By the way, that's everything the universe is made up of. We have one God who is three persons. We have one universe made up of three things, time, space, and matter. 
Now, in the beginning, that's time, God created the heaven, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. Now, you look at each one of those. Time, it's one thing, but it's really three, past, present, and future. We have a God who is one, but he is three. Uh, what is space? It's one thing, but it's three, with depth and height. Well, what is matter? It's one thing, but it's three, solid, liquid, and gas. Now we have a problem. It's called plasma. There's another PhD problem for some of you young ones. Where does it fit? Where does plasma fit? The scientists don't know where to put it. Maybe it's one of the three aspects of a solid, and they've mislabeled some, or they haven't found something, or there's a different way of looking at something, or a different way of interpreting something. There's all kinds of projects here for young people. You, what are you? Well, you're one, but you're really three, body, soul, and spirit. Uh, how about the atom? We have one atom, major parts, proton, neutron, and electron. God says in Romans 1, we can see aspects of the Godhead, not perfect, not a perfect analogy, but we can see aspects of the Godhead, the Trinity, in what He has made. Uh, fruit. Now, I went to our church to the little kids, and I said, why don't you all come up with one thing that's three? So a few of these come from them. It might be a little bit of a stretch, but what do you have with fruit? Well, you have the skin, the flesh, and the seed. Well, what, what, are, what, what do we need for life? Well, we need air, water, and food. Uh, how about a tooth, being a dentist? I did do this one. What do we have? We got the enamel, and we have the dentin, and we have the cementum, major parts of a tooth. You can take some of those parts apart, but you still have a tooth, uh, but you need all of it to have a, a whole tooth. What, what's your mouth made up of? Well, it's made up primarily of bone, teeth, and soft tissues. How about a... Uh, a bit of dirt. What, what is dirt? Well, basically, it's minerals and it's organic compounds and inorganic compounds. And, and, and we have three kinds of heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars, says God. That brings up an interesting question. Uh, did you know that God never calls our sun a star? He always says the sun, the moon, and the stars, or the greater light and the lesser lights. By the way, did you see that eclipse the other night? Wasn't that amazing? Yes, we were down in Colorado Springs, way up there high. We could see it really, really well. Uh, God never calls our sun a star. Well, if our sun is not a star, then much about we know about the stars might be false because the astronomers have studied our sun, which they say is our closest star, and they take that information, put it out here on these stars that are far away. What if our sun is not really a star? We need a PhD in astronomy that goes to the Bible first and says, you know what? I wonder if our sun is not a star. That might change all the information, or a lot of it, that we have about stars. God says right here, even the stars differ from each other in glory. What a neat thing. God never calls the sun a star, therefore much of what we know about stars may not be true. There's all kinds of area for study for our young people here. The Bible names three heavens, the third heaven, the stellar heaven, atmospheric heaven. Uh, God reveals himself in three ways, through the Bible, through creation, and through conscience. By the way, through creation. There is a, a, a jellyfish, and the body of the jellyfish, it has a blue light, but in the tentacles, it has yellow lights, and when a prey, it lives deep down in the ocean, this is one of the deep down ones, and when a prey comes to get the jellyfish, he turns off his lights. Well, how does he know that that thing wants to eat him? Let's say it keeps chasing him, and he decides, I think it's going to catch me. He'll turn the lights back on, on some of his tentacles, and then he separates his tentacles. He, 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 he dislocates, he, he cuts them off from his body, and they keep wiggling, and they're going off this way with the light in them, whereas the main jellyfish goes off this way. He didn't turn the blue light on. He only turned on the yellow lights in the tentacles to, to act as bait to get the fish to go that way, and then he regrows his tentacles. How could that evolve, you see? Uh, and through the conscience. And then, uh, what is, what's music? Well, it's, it's one thing, but it's three, isn't it? It's melody, harmony, and rhythm. By the way, that very same church I was just talking about, they had a young man there that was the drummer. And there's 150 kids, and none are singing. Well, five. We saw five singing, because I couldn't hear myself sing, because he's playing his drum so loud. So afterwards, I said to him, young man, I love you, but brother, I said, if you're going to enhance worship, you're going to have to learn how to play your drum so you can hear the people sing, because you're in no way enhancing their worship when you're doing a drum solo. And he took it pretty well. Well, I think he did. I left town. But anyway, <laughs> um, water, yeah, what is it? Well, liquid, gas, solid, one thing that's three. We have the rainbow. What's it, what's it made up of? Well, water, light, and air. We have all these things. What's a plant? Basically, it's your root, it's your stem, it's your leaf. 
Uh, how about uh, time? Well, we have days, we have months, and we have years. I didn't mention a week. Why not? Because there's no celestial indicators for a week. But everybody works by the week, don't they? Why don't, why don't, we, why don't I say week? Well, well, there's no celestial indicators. But we all celebrate a week, a seven-day week. We're on it right now. The French are even on it. They went to a 10-day week during, the, the, during their revolution. They're going to be an atheistic society. They're doing away with God. They went to a 10-day week. They're back on a seven-day week. It's the only way it works. But there's no celestial indicators. It's God telling us, look, I made it all in six days. I rested on the seventh, just like you work for six days and rest on the seventh. There's no other way that works, even though there's no indicators, celestial indicators for it. It's another testimony to our Lord and His power. Time. It can also be seconds, minutes, and hours. And then uh, we have a tree. Well, what could a tree be? Well, it could be the root, it could be the trunk, and it could be the leaves, branches, okay? Uh, then we have a biblical marriage. And what's that? Well, we have God, and then in submission to God is the husband. In submission to God and the husband is the wife. And you know what happened at the fall? The whole created order got flip-flopped. What was God's created order? It was God, and in submission to God is the woman, excuse me, is the man. In submission to the man is his woman. In submission to mankind is the animal kingdom. Now, what happened at the fall? The whole thing got flip-flopped. And now we have an animal, the serpent, and the woman submits to the animal, and the man submits to his wife. Hey, uh, Adam, uh, you want a bite? Okay. He submits to his wife. Where's that put God? Right on the bottom. You know what that does? It elevates animals to be more important than people. So what do we see in our culture? There's more laws to protect animals than there are people in a, in a, in a mother's womb. There's more laws to protect baby bats than baby humans. Okay. So the whole created order got flip-flopped. But a biblical marriage, what's a biblical family? By the way, a biblical marriage is a man and a woman. And uh, yeah, now, now listen, I'll, I'll encourage you, I'll encourage you, you can vote on next Tuesday for biblical marriage, okay? You can vote for that, okay? Uh, biblical family, father, mother, and children. Not daddy, two daddies and children. It's not two mommies and children. A biblical family is a father, a mother, and the kids. All right, none of the above illustrations of one thing composed of three major elements is a flawless picture of the perfect God of the Bible. I agree with that. The God of the Bible is one, but He is three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, just a little bit more. The Trinitarian God of the Bible is the uncaused cause. Christians believe by faith that the eternal God of the Bible is the uncaused cause of the creation of the universe. Atheistic evolutionists believe by faith that matter or matter and energy is or are the eternal, and they or it is the uncaused cause of the universe. Now, why do I say that? Well, because I go on campuses, and the students will often come up with, well, where did your God come from? Or, well, who made your God? And I answer that with a question. Where did your matter come from? And who made your matter? You see, everybody believes by faith in something eternal. You either believe by faith in eternal God, or you believe by faith in eternal matter, or eternal matter and energy. Our universe is an effect. The God of the Bible is the cause. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Everybody agrees the, that the universe is a cause. It, I mean, it's an effect of something. Uh, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. It's called the Lord Jesus. Uh, argument for an intelligent cause of DNA. Language is caused by intelligence. Nobody disagrees. You don't have language without intelligence. By the way, I put these up on the campuses and it goes silent. I mean, we can be in classrooms, boo, hiss. At the University of Minnesota, the atheists and the humanists cancel their meetings to come to ours. They sit in the three rows here in this auditorium. Boo, hiss, you stupid old man. They're yelling. I put this up. Silence. Okay. <laughs> language is caused by intelligence. They all agree. DNA is language. It is. DNA tells your fingernails go on top. If your fingernails came off underneath, you'd slip off everything. Uh, <laughs> DNA says to your nose, go on with the holes down. If the holes are up, it's a rainy day, you're in trouble, okay? Uh, DNA says when, when you get 65, your hair falls out. And there it is, see? <laughs> DNA is language. Therefore, DNA had an intelligent cause. Silence on the campuses. I think, oh, Lord, this silence is wonderful. And, uh, oh, I'm not talking about you, but when I'm on these campuses. But, uh, so, Genesis 1, 
31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Does that just mean the stars and those kinds of things, or could that include the angels? Did God make the angels within that six-day week? A lot of Christians believe the angels were here long before the six-day week. Well, does any scripture give us any help on this? Could the angels be called the host? Could they be included? Well, how about 1 Kings twenty-two nineteen? 19? And he said, Hear ye therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. What does God tell us right in the middle of the Ten Commandments? For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all that is in them. God made everything that he made, that would include the angels, and he did it all in six days, about 6,000 years ago, and that's all we can get from the Bible. The Trinitarian God of the Bible made everything within the six 24-hour days of the creation week, that's the heaven, the earth, the seas, and all that's in them. The Trinity, God the Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, through the agency of the Lord Jesus, created all that exists, and He did it within the six 24-hour day creation week. Nothing was here before the first day of the six days of creation. There were no angels, no devil, no sun, no sin, no death, no pre-Adamic race, no gap, no billions of years, no floods, no caveman. Nothing was here before the first day of the six day week, right in the Ten Commandments. Jesus, then, is the Creator. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, talking about Jesus. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, John 1. Well, how about Colossians 1? For by Him, Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth. All things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. King James, it means hold together. He holds everything together. The scientists don't know what holds everything together. When I went to college, it was invisible, cold, dark matter that hold everything together. And it, but they never found any of that. I guess it was too invisible. And so now they're telling us neutrinos hold it all together. But I just looked neutrinos up on the internet. Now they, they don't have any mass. How can something with no mass hold things together? So they'll probably now come up with, oh yeah, they have mass. We were mistaken on that. They don't know what holds it together because they won't believe in God. God says, I hold it together. So he built it. So if you carefully study it, you will see there has to be somebody holding this thing together. Jesus is the creator. Hebrews 1, God has spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had him by himself purged our sins. The creator is the redeemer. Each of us is unique in the universe. You're special. We're designed by the Lord Jesus. Only the creator, the designer, the author has the right and the authority and the power to change his creation, his design, or his composition. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Only the creator has the right to redeem his creature. Jesus is the creator. Therefore, he has the right to be the redeemer. The Lord Jesus, the creator, the redeemer, the savior, the Messiah, true Christians, are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. 1 Peter 1 and verse 2. The Trinity, the whole Trinity is involved in your salvation. But Jesus, as the Creator, is the one that died. He is the one that put His life up and gave it up for you. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, only the Creator has the right and the authority and the power to be our Redeemer. Romans 10 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? Now, I thought we might try something. I've been a few of these before, but we haven't ever sang anything, sung anything. Sing or sung, sang. Well, whatever we do here. Uh, I thought we would try to sing something together, a cappello. And let's try this. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let's hear some harmony.
Let's speed it up just a little. Our God is holy, holy, holy. There's only one way that we can come into the presence of a holy, holy, holy God. We have to have His holiness. And He says that comes to us as we put our faith and trust in His Son and in the shed blood of His Son that washes us as white as snow. If you have a heavy burden of sin on your shoulders, God says, I can lift that off and wash you as white as snow when you put your faith and trust in my resurrected Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this God has made so many things in His creation that He wants us to study and give Him the glory. So I want to share one more. There's a little frog in Puerto Rico, and this little frog communicates in three ways. It, commu it communicates with chirps, with thumps and with chuckles. Now, here's what it does. The male frog wants to stake out its territory. So, it will blow up its neck. As it's chirping, it, it blows up its neck to chirp, but it blows up its neck so big and so fast that the neck thumps on the ground under it. And so, it's communicating with the chirp through the air but the thump is so hard, it sends out a seismic wave that other male frogs can sense. So the other frogs hear the chirp, and they sense the thump, but they're traveling at two different rates of speed, because the seismic thump travels slower than the chirp, which travels through the air, so that the other male frogs can tell where that frog is and how far away it is because they interpret the thump and the chirp, which gives them two different aspects of sound coming to them, and then they respond with a chuckle. And that tells the fellow that's over here thumping and chirping where they are, and they know how far away and where he is, and that's how they stake out their territory. Now, how would that evolve? How would a toad learn how to pass seismic waves as well as sound through the air? And then how would the other toads know how to interpret it? Only God could do that. And He is the God of the Bible, and He is one, but He is three. Let me have a word of prayer. Father, we thank You that You are the, the one, unique, all-powerful all-knowing, omnipresent God, the Trinitarian God of the Bible. Father, we worship you, who you're one, and yet you're three. And we can't understand that. And there's no way in our human finite mind that we can understand that. And yet you've given us examples all through your creation of one thing that is three. It's not a perfect example of you. Nothing is perfect like you. And yet you, you've told us, look, just look at my creation, and we can kind of have a hint at what it means to be one thing who is three. And so, Father, I pray if someone in this room, they haven't put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior, their Creator, who is their Redeemer, I pray today would be their day of salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This has been The Trinity in Time, Space, and Matter, presented by Job Martin. To receive a free catalog of all of our Bible teaching books and tapes, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach, call 800-977-2177, 24 hours a day, or on the web at compass.org.